Okay, this is the uh, broadband committee meeting, the second of two that we've had planned for this particular broadband study. And before we get started, I know you won't be able to film this, but I'd like everybody to kind of introduce themselves. We'll just tell us uh, what your name is and what company you represent. And then we'll start at the back row here with Jake, and we'll just uh, go across the back row and come up around this side and get back to the front. Jacob Anderson, Click Attack County, uh, Natural Resources and Economic Development. Dana Peck, Coldale Chamber of Commerce. Justin Lee, City Council, Golden Man. Jeff Stoner, Way of Business. Good. Andy Holm, City Council from Little Window. Uh, Carrie Pippinich, Mid Columbia Economic Development District. Mylon Walling, Golden Dale City Council. Ken Gross, HTC. HTC? That's right. <laughs> Good work, Nancy. Got it. And we have over here. My name is Scott Kyler with WSP USA, and we're uh, here to deliver the draft broadband study for the city. And my name is Ethan Spoo, and I'm also with WSP, and I'm a senior planner there, and I'm helping Scott out with this project. Okay, and I'm Larry Bellamy, City Administrator with the City of Goldendale. So, now we have everybody introduced. I think we'll just go right into your presentation. Uh, if you have not already picked it up, there's an agenda, and then there's also a handout that are over there on that table. So if anybody needs that, uh, go ahead and get that. If you, don't, if you don't have a copy of the plan, there's extras. So if you want to grab one of those, you can. <clears throat> and whichever one I'll start and start, go for it. Thank you, Larry. Um, what I'd like to do is just remind the broadband planning committee members that uh, this is also a public meeting. So we're thinking about this as being more of an interactive workshop. So if we do have questions, how many uh, committee members from the broadband planning group do we have? We've got several of you today. Yes. And this particular uh, project was initiated under a state curb grant, and it's essentially a 2019 study. We've been at this for about nine months. And the idea is to, that the state is looking to assess indirect improved broadband as an economic development tool for uh, rural communities. So that's really what uh, our firm was selected to do uh, working with you all through the broadband committee, which was underway when we started. You'll recall we had, uh, we had some good snowfall last year. We had a little delay in the project while we got our, our first meeting off the ground. And because most of the um, meeting time between the committee and the public was spent really interactive and was a bit uh, seamless, we've just combined those tonight. So we're here tonight to deliver to you uh, a summary of the findings uh, from this effort. It does include an assessment of existing conditions for broadband. It includes a look at the market opportunities within Goldendale, uh, see what some of the uh, key uh, industries and economic opportunities are and how those are served. Uh, we also took time to adjust the scope midstream while we were working with the ISPs and get more community data. So we worked with the city on a, on a survey to see uh, if we could learn more about how folks are using broadband locally. In the end, we came up with an assessment of where generally broadband services are in the community, took a look at where we could improve those, and there are largely improvement areas that the four ISPs locally are already working in to improve, uh, but we took a, a, a broad scope look at underground and overhead improvements that we could do to better serve certain areas or provide redundancy in a price for those. Ultimately, this strategy is by name a strategy. We came up with a number of um, opportunities that we saw uh, that you'll hear about tonight for the city to to leverage the, the findings uh, towards additional assistance, whether that be as a partner for um, you know, breaking down any code barriers, continuing as a good partner for building the system, uh, looking for grants or low interest loans that might help uh, to bring about change 
positive change in economic development, um, perhaps even sooner. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop, and Ethan's going to talk to you a bit about the, the background, existing conditions, and market findings. Uh, then we, we concluded with the pro forma, how would you pay for this, sources of funding, and I'll talk a bit on the back side of your two pagers about implementation um, the strategies that are also shown on the board. So you've got the map, the strategies, and uh, Ethan, take yeah. it away. Thanks, Scott. So um, obviously in any study it's important to talk about um, existing conditions because those are the things that inform um, the development of the plan. So you have to kind of read the tea leaves a little bit to kind of see what they're telling you. Um, and so as Scott mentioned, we took a look at a number of different existing conditions including a market. We had a user survey that was sent out in the city's utility bills. Um, one month and had about 85 responses on, on that. And then we did some of our own existing conditions research in terms of looking at uh, the demographics um, in Goldendale. Um, and so I just wanted to touch on some of those highlights uh, for you here tonight. Um, and you know, if you have any questions, you can feel free to stop us as we're as we're talking through this and um, uh, let us know what those. With, let us know what those questions are, if they're, even if they're just comments. <clears throat> so, um, so, in terms of demographics, I mean, I, I, I think some of this stuff won't be too surprising for some of you, um, but uh, Goldendale does have a lower percentage of internet subscribers than uh, the United States as a whole, uh, in terms of a percent, percentage, um, or the state of Washington. So. 34% uh, of Goldendale households do not have internet access, so about one-third, versus 18% nationally and 12% in Washington. Now, obviously, Washington is sort of a high-tech state, especially when you're talking about the industries that you have uh, over in Seattle and, and the demographics that you have happening there. So um, <clears throat> it might be better to sort of compare Goldendale to the nation as a whole. Um, so the, the city, you know, does have uh, some work to do in that sense in terms of connecting um, more uh, of its households and, and user base to, to the internet. <clears throat> um, and that information is coming from what's called the American Community Survey, which is kind of this every two year um, survey that goes out um, to uh, cities and jurisdictions all over the country. Um, <clears throat> So uh, Scott mentioned the map as well, and, and we kind of took a look at, based upon some of the information that the ISPs provided to us about their existing um, systems that they have in the ground um, and, and aerially, as well as uh, where they're proposing to put uh, service in the future, we sort of lined those up and, and figured out where some of the gaps are. Um, and what we figured out is that there's some gaps in uh, South Goldendale, along Simcoe Road, um, into the industrial park, and then North uh, Goldendale, um, north of, of Broadway. So those are kind of your, your main gap areas. Now the area north of Broadway is um, a little bit more sparsely populated, obviously. <clears throat> One thing we might just point out, we do want this to be conversational, is it's, a, it's, it's really overlaying existing systems where there might be additional capacity um, improvements. Simcoe Drive is a main uh, route and we have a lot of uh, jobs and, and primary users that can come off of that. And I think that the, it's fair to say that the, the ISPs have shown as we've interviewed stakeholders and looked at their systems that they're putting significant infrastructure now uh, into the ground and overhead and this just augments that. Right, so redundancy is one of the mm -hmm. objectives there. Um, and then <coughs> we, I, I mentioned the broadband user survey again, that went out in the city's utility bills. We got 85 responses. Um, vast majority of those were from households, so there was about 80% of those were households and 20% were businesses. Um, and some of the findings of that were that uh, at least as the users were reporting it, they reported speeds of 10.2 megabits per second download and 2.05 um, upload. 
Um, so that is pretty slow. Now the thing that we don't know from that user survey is whether that's just the service that the, the user is choosing to pay for or if that's all that's available to them. Um, that, that wasn't specified on, on the survey. Um, we can talk about that a little bit more later. <clears throat> and they also reported that some of those speeds are limiting their ability to access the internet for certain purposes, uh, whether that was, um, uh, you know, in the case of uh, residential users, ac accessing entertainment types of things, but and then um, for businesses downloading large files and, <clears throat> and streaming videos like you would typically have for um, uh, video conference uh, capabilities. Um, the market assessment, um, that was a piece that was put together by our project team, one of our sub-consultants, McKinsey, uh, worked on that. Um, and so that sort of pointed out what some of the main industries here in Golendale are and what some of the, those industries are that would benefit the most from faster uh, internet speeds. Um, so, in particular, healthcare, government, and energy <coughs> um, would be uh, particularly benefited by having uh, faster internet speeds. Um, so, you know, in the case of education, um, I think some, you know, that's probably a good example to take a look at because um, uh, that, that's one that we're all familiar with in terms of our kids going to school or us going to school. And so, uh, kids are needing to connect to the internet more and more to, to either do research projects or uh, inter interact in the classroom with uh, teachers, um, as well as just get trained for the future for employment opportunities. And so that's a, that's a pretty big deal because when people are considering moving into Goldendale, that's one of the things that they would think about is the quality of of schools and, and the type of education that um, their, their kid would be receiving. <clears throat> um, one of the main findings of the market study, of course, was that there's this discrepancy, and that got pointed out on the, the user survey as well, but there's this discrepancy in what people are willing to pay and, and what they say they want, you know. So in some ways that's, that's uh, to be expected from these types of exercises because, you know, people, if you ask them, hey, do you want faster internet speed? Well, of course. And then, are you willing to pay for it? Well, then that... Not so much. Not so much. <laughs> but that, that forces them to do a little bit of a reality evaluation. And so, I think the figure that we, um, uh, we honed in on was that 70 per, uh, excuse me, 17% of uh, users were willing to pay $60 or more per month and from what we can tell looking at kind of the existing internet user packages um, that are out there $55 a month is kind of the average so we're, we're basically saying that 17% of, of the users would be willing to pay more than the, the average right now. <clears throat> um, we did put together what we call the model code um, uh, memo and be some best practices research that we looked at and that took a look at uh, the national uh, model code uh, from the National League of Cities for um, for broadband um, and it, it also looked at some examples in Washington in this case we, we looked at the city of Polsbo and we tried to pull some of the best pieces out of out of those codes um, and, and apply them and, and make recommendations in terms of what Goldendale could do to improve its code. And so some of the main things there, of course, would be if Goldendale could update its, its definitions to talk more about telecommunications facilities and, and um, infrastructure, um, as well as uh, come up with some construction standards so that when the uh, ISPs are proposing uh, to put new facilities in right of way that there's a certain standard that that is, is built to and the city knows what that is. Um, so uh, those were some of the... I think there was a little look at in the market study at uh, Santa Cruz as well, so a couple of right models were looked at for how they're handling either the code or other aspects of implementing broadband. Right. So that, that was, um, backing up just a little bit to the, the market assessment, um, one of the findings of that or one of the recommendations of that was 
um, the city, the city and the county of Santa Cruz, California, because we had had discussions with staff um, earlier about what type of model they wanted to use in terms of um, approaching this issue, and they had said that they would want to be facilitators. Um, helping out the existing I ISPs in improving their services. Um, <clears throat> and so Santa Cruz, California was kind of one that rose to the top of the list and they're one um, example um, where they uh, removed barriers and, and mm -hmm. uh, updated their code and then sort of also formed partnerships in the community to help um, with the ISPs to help make um, uh, improved broadband happen. Um, so I'm going to skip on down a little bit. We talked to you about the proposed system plan somewhat, um, the cost estimates that went along with that, and so we have some engineers that are backing us up that, that took a look at um, what it would cost um, to uh, put some new lines in the ground and, and overhead um, in some of the areas that we've identified on that map over there. Um, and the figure that, that we came to um, in talking to the ISPs was generally speaking putting new lines um, above ground on existing poles is something uh, around $10 per linear foot. <clears throat> um, and putting new lines underground is around $40 per linear foot. And so those are kind of the estimates that are driving that. And so you have, um, I think it's maybe about 45,000 linear feet of new lines in ground and above uh, ground that are shown on that map over there. And so that um, <clears throat> gets you to a total cost estimate of, of 2.1 million um, to, to build out that system. And so, um, uh, you know, an important uh, aspect of that, or important thing to remember about that, that we can talk about a little bit more as well, is that's not $2.1 million that the city would pay that's $2.1 million for that combined system improvement. That could be a combination of the ISPs um, building, building that out and then also the city getting um, low interest loans or grants um, to, to help out with that. <clears throat> Which brings us to the Performa. And so the Performa, if you don't know what that is, that's kind of assessing what the return on investment would be of, of making um, um, these improvements and so the performa that we had completed by our economic consultant um, took a look at four different scenarios uh, the first one was the base case scenario they called it and that was well what would happen if there was no public money put into this could the ISPs make a positive return on investment uh, from that and what that uh, revealed was that they probably could not um, and then the other three scenarios looked at various mixes of public funds uh, going into uh, being injected into the project to make those uh, system improvements um, and resulting in a positive return on investment. So I think we can say with a fairly high degree of confidence that <clears throat> in order to build out the system that you see there, that you would have to have some kind of public investment uh, in order to do that, um, uh, you, you know, probably in the form of, of state grants, but it could also be federal federal grants. So though, that's kind of a summary of the existing conditions. I'm not sure if there's any questions out there, um, but uh, those existing conditions, as I said, are really kind of informing and driving that, that plan, and we figured it was important to share those with you so you have, um, uh, and, and we all have uh, some context on, on what uh, was helping us formulate the, the plan. While you're thinking about those questions, the only thing I would add to Ethan's summary is um, this existing and proposed broadband system plan for Goldendale is kind of a snapshot in time. There are improvements being made now uh, and we've taken general input and generalized where we're going to need more improvements for $2 million. Uh, that does not mean that that would not be built over time as the market and population grows, how much time? But what he's indicating is um, the, the general planning level engineering costs are $2 million. And there are probably some ways that Larry and the city could intervene as a public agency that 
that the ISPs may not have access to, uh, such as um, low interest loans, monies, uh, revolving loans. And we know that uh, partners such as, as, as McKed have some experience in administering. We're also quite aware that um, uh, the city's um, got an open for business attitude and a good report from the ISP. So this in, in no way um, tries to uh, do anything more than uh, make an action plan that the whole community can hopefully coalesce around. So if you do see issues in the existing conditions or what we found, you know, we'd love to make tweaks. And at the end of the day, I think it'd be successful if we all sort of agreed this is a good direction to jump off and, and try to get some, something happening in terms of shared interests and, and resources. So, <clears throat> not really a question, but just an observation as I'm looking at your map and that. So we actually, HTC, of course we do, we have fiber in town, cable and wireless, all three mediums to provide service for. But we actually have network Literally about 95% of the town right now could walk in our store and get 100 meg internet. We have network in most of these, virtually all of these proposed areas except for the ones that go through the fields that uh, we couldn't use really, but, but all these others, we already have infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. And they could, in fact, offer internet right now. And I think it's, um, it's a really good point. And we've talked about this and making the map and coming out here tonight. What doesn't show well on the map is the yellow. When we put the purple over proposed upgrades, kind of like I wrote purple on the title over the yellow title here. And that is probably, it's making a stark contrast between what is existing and what could be. So I think we really recognize and appreciate your contribution to existing conditions. And, and what we're trying to do here is show kind of where the economic focus is, where we need maybe some improvements that you're already planning on with that additional They're fiber. already done. The purple, no, like I'm saying, most of the purple right. should be yellow. It's already It's done. finished. And I it's mean, served with redundant fiber. Yeah. I'm... Maybe a few gaps. And, and I guess it's not a perfect map. It's a generalized kind of area to focus. And I think when we say engineers looked at it, I don't want you to think of it as an engineer plan. Some of your next steps would be to say, well, let's look at South Goldendale. What do we really have and get with you and say, maybe that, you know, maybe we're really kind of 25% off on that one. And we're really going to focus some, in some of these other areas. So I, I think that's really good information. We should go back to Dan, have a discussion about, and is it mostly in the South? Or is there a little bit of... No, I have all that. To, I mean, there's nothing up here, really, mm -hmm. except we do have fiber, actually. And we have conduit up to Conduit, there. yeah. I heard about that. But we have network here, here, pretty much, like I say, most, about 95% can walk in right now and get it. Mm -hmm. So it's both north and south. We don't do the industrial, like from about here over. I don't do Easy Street, although it would be nice, because it sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, easy to do. So one thing we could do is we could come to the conclusion that um, you know, when you're generalizing plan and plan area improvements and the engineers get a hold of it, the costs go up a bit. Uh, but maybe what we want to do is take a little tighter look at some of those areas, share some information, come up with uh, something in the final that might be a little more affordable. But I think the idea is there that um, this isn't something the city is going to pick up and walk away with and provide retail service, but rather help pick up some slack where you need to build those lines. So we'll, we'll look at those areas. Other comments or questions? Yes. Is that map all fiber that's shown, or is that everything no. that you just, everybody told you about? Right, what we have to do is to report in the aggregate and generally for the ISPs because there's some proprietary information, and so we're only able to report out generally underground and overhead, so it's a mix of approaches. It's not just a fiber map. So it's all broadband. And I'm correct in that. It's a mix of all of those services. Yeah, the yellow that <clears throat> you may or may not be able to see from where you're at are the existing lines and then the purple are the proposed mm -hmm. overhead, I, I think. Um, or do I have that switch? What's that? Oh, are they lines or areas of coverage? 
your existing lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, so so the purple and the blue are the proposed that you're seeing. So, so we'll run under. So you don't know if it's cable, DSL, or what those lines, or fiber, what those lines are. We have a pretty good idea what that is. I think what we're saying is that the ISPs have asked that we not share all of that information because some of it's proprietary. So, so maybe what we need that's far more accurate is a gaps map than this map. Because it sounds like the map isn't current if you're having one of the ISPs tell you that we have all this covered, which would completely change your numbers because what we're really talking about is getting broadband too deep. And it'd be more important for the city, you know, I think, about where your gaps are at, where nobody can get coverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, too. Um, and so one thing I'd just like to point out there is that there's some areas of redundancy on purpose. And so just because there was, say, one provi provider in a particular location didn't mean that we said, okay, we're not going to touch that, that area. So the objective was to create some of those redundancies, but also serve areas that aren't served right now. What? Well, I'm just going to say, I, I always think that the industrial parkway would be definitely something, but I'm surprised that the uh, gas power plant, Larry, doesn't have... Um, I, I don't think they have it. I'm, not sure of that okay. because none of the ISPs said that they served that area. Okay, I'm just surprised um, that they didn't have it. But then anyway, it's they may be hooked up some way. Yeah. It's just that that wasn't reported to us from the ISPs. Is that that's fair to say, right? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can oh, uh, I mean, I guess. And maybe this is a little bit to Jake's point, maybe we're saying the same thing, but I think it'd be helpful to be able to see, um, rather than mm -hmm. the network lines, the areas that have that, whichever threshold that 25 or 100 meg available to the residents and businesses, um, and whether that's from one provider or two, however you would, I mean, I love the idea of having that coverage with multiple providers if possible, but I think that might be a little bit maybe a more helpful way to to understand where the gaps in that service are versus the physical lines. Right, and so you're, you would want to um, be mixing sort of the information that we have there with some speed information is what you're saying, right? I mean, if that's and, data that you have available from the conversations with the providers. Well, I, I don't think we have to parse that exactly. Speed data. We have service. some from one of the provi providers. We have some general speed um, zones, I guess you would say. Um, now, again, some of that information they've indicated that they don't want shared. We could approach them again, potentially, and ask them about that. What would be okay with them to to share? But that's we we did I we did think about that. Yeah, it would be great to have some, be able to show that information. So I recognize it's Monday Night Football Night, and we don't want this to go too long. But speaking from us, when I say you could come in, so most of ours are pretty much all wired. And it would be 95% could get 100 May, and then uh, those would be, it wouldn't be a far build to average So that's... Whole is that something you would share your 5% gaps or where those locations are? Because that would be, I would think, be where the city would be willing to work towards filling in gaps. And if it's you have gaps and CenturyLink have gaps, that would be really nice to know because those people are literally stuck with AT&T or something like that. So, yeah, <clears throat> we can. The, the 5% is a lot more of the drop is just going to take us long. Like we might have to go under road to get the drop to them. It's not that we can't service them, but they couldn't just walk in and we could get it to them the next day. But we really can almost do the whole town except the chamber. <laughs> <laughs>
as far you know, as this is far just, as just to clarify this. <laughs> <laughs> this this gaps analysis was a very large part of this study in our effort. We worked with the ISPs above and beyond the rounds of stakeholder interviews and additional meetings that were originally scoped. It's difficult to get to what you want on a map that's public. But I, I appreciate that you're here and sharing generally enough that you know we can understand that from one ISP. It's just difficult to get right down to the nuts and bolts of where those gaps are. We've, we've been trying to do that. But Wade's it's got a public facing map that we can distribute. It's on a KMZ file. But oh. it all the customer information has been removed. So right. if you just want to know where the fiber is, yeah. I you think can get that to you. Have we seen that, Ethan? Yeah, we've seen mm -hmm. that. And I believe that that's reflected up there. Does it, it seem? Yeah. 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 But if anyone wants a copy of it. There you go. Yeah, I, I thought we used that. I think this is too, way more than what I think we even ex hope to get out of this. So thank you. Oh, really thank you. Piece of work. I got to think this curve board is going to be real pleased with this too. It's one of the first efforts to do municipal. To me, this has always been a gateway to get more money for the ISPs to you know do whatever they think makes sense. If you pro form, I you know, I would think somewhere between five and eighteen percent makes it attractive if you get the public money thrown in. I think this is a great way to leverage public money. But the question I'd ask, since we got half of our ISPs represented, is what would, if, assuming we can use this to leverage more state and federal money, what would be the best relationship the city could build to get it to you? I mean, would it be an RFP process of some sort? Would it, would it be, and I'm, I'm, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I just, I think it would have to be an RFP. Yeah. Is, is that something that, in your experience, can be done collaboratively, or is it something that you want to bid on individually? I mean, it could be done collaboratively. Um, you guys whether you the ISPs would no, no, want no, to do uh, that, <laughs> go we're ahead. We're to partner with anybody uh -huh. to, to grow the business, so it's, it's including public private partnerships. I think that's the way you really need to approach it is partnering with with private companies to really be effective. Um, that should have been the whole intent of this all along. Is to, you know, we we find that we find the supplemental money and you folks do the work and on the system. Mm -hmm. and, and so so the RFP concept really works. Is, do we, does the city have a franchise agreement right now, or I just I don't even know the answer to that. Yes. Okay, so does the city have any existing needs to connect their current buildings together that they could use as like a RFP vehicle? Then the ISPs could uh, potentially quote on that type of network. And we're current, currently the cities, all the cities' in, in, internet needs are. In place, okay. and, they can, and we have interconnectivity amongst the different buildings and offices that we have. Uh, but we can always look at doing a new RFP to see if there's some other company that would like to provide us a, the same service at a lesser cost, mm -hmm. or a better delivery system of some kind. So the RFP would be a proposal as opposed to a, a bid. We're not just going to look at the money aspect, but we're going to look at the overall service aspect, speeds, um, reliability, and things like that. So, yeah, so I have a question. So if we, if there are, there's confidential proprietary information involving these systems, and we want to go get grant money, or we want to put a liability on the city's books by getting an expensive loan, how do we reconcile those two things? Let's, you know, if we want a million and a half dollars for something that we don't even know whether it exists or not because an ISP won't tell us. They don't want, you know, 
what we're basically giving them money to do work, but we don't know if the work needs to be done or not. Well, the, maybe can I try one? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a great question. I think that the, um, and, and I might pause in answering that and just go over our recommendations, but the idea of low interest loan or grant money is predicated on, one, there's a need to receive the CURB grant for it. Two, we have identified gaps that need filling for an amount. Uh, and, and, and three, that the city's trying to minimize its risks and obligations and be really facilitating and enabling this to happen. So um, I think it might be uh, bringing this back too far to indicate that there, there is not a need because we've documented that. Um, I do think as you go into next steps, you kind of want to sit down and, and peel back those layers of the onions and decide kind of where it is, where is the need best met, and then you can think about how you get the funds to go to that engineering phase and kind of design a few projects and how you pay for those. Um, I do think it's a fair question, how much risk would the city actually want to take on to address a problem that you know, the market's eventually going to address. And the other side of that question is, how much do you want to venture or get involved to advance economic de development objectives in partnership to accelerate job growth and service? I mean, I don't know if that helped, but I, I do think there's a fair question there. How much risk? But when you're applying for a loan, how much specificity do we have to include with a project? I mean, you know, there might be a gap, but we don't know about it. You've got a pretty good indication um, that there's a need for public funding to entice the market, but you don't have exact information about, other than the information we've given you on about what it costs and how many feet exactly where that would go. I think that's going to take you know, a little bit further information, but I don't know, Dana, I kind of tend to think like you do if everybody's on board with trying to fill that gap. There's a there's an opportunity, as we did with uh, Richfield, and, and they took our plan and got a million dollars they put in the ground to help serve that community. I think there's an opportunity. But I think one of his questions is mm -hmm. going to be that you're going to talk about it on the, on the well, list there, just in terms of just to get what us <laughs> the city require. Yeah, let's just get all on the same page, and I won't belabor this. So we're recommending updating the code, building partnerships, seeking funding. It's on page two. Developing the system and marketing broadband services to industries. And we think it's important to get all the players, uh, the EDA, McKed, and County together, you know, as, as soon as fall, while the, while the study is still uh, fresh out and, and really talk about what this means. File funding requests with CURB. They're, they're going to have your, um, your product. And I think that, that that's an important next step because it's first come first serve money. You heard in, from the, the governor's office staff at our last regional Friday meeting that the uh, construction dollars are moving over to the public works board and that they are in process of developing what those grant programs will look like. Um, and I believe they were removing all of the construction dollars for project specifically from the code moving them over. Mm -hmm. So just a note to reflect perhaps in that implementation plan is to keep sure. no, that's very good. that shift in that funding source and what those parameters will be because I think that helps to maybe look at some of those questions about what the city is eligible for in terms of grant dollars and where those where and how those can be we're all pretty comfortable with the public works funding process too is you know mixed I mean, is there money for our for our code update? I mean, when we want to update like our dangerous dog code, it's very time consuming. <laughs> but, um, this this is like you know a lot of work. Yeah. And um, we have we're pretty limited in our resources to do that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. My thinking would be if if not through these broadband systems, there's probably something that uh, commerce has for you for okay. code updates. Good questions. So we're just talking about looking at additional funding sources. We talked about maybe issuing an RFP, uh, administration of funds such as something like a uh, revolving loan fund or some ISPs. We've got some partners as a city with, with MCED and EDA, revising the code, 
And I think it's important to look at um, the franchise agreements permitting construction drawings. I mean, these could be tied into the RFP or even just a, a code updating permit process. So you start to document what's going into the ground with the as built so we have something a little more clear on the map. I'm going to take some notes while you're talking. Mm -hmm. There's questions. Yeah, so I think, I, I think we should continue the good questions and see, um, see if we can't get some more answers as we go into the, the final study for you. Yes. Okay, uh, on your pro forma, was it correct that you guys were looking at $90 per person per month was what they were, the average of what the charges are going to be when you did that design? And if so, where did the $90 per person per month come from for a residential customer when you have between 37 and 43 percent of the population that's in lower moderate income on those census blocks? You want to speak to the pro forma? Yeah, I mean, that is correct. And so, I mean, I think um, one of the assumptions that our economic consultant made was that um, as uh, the system got upgraded, people would be willing to pay more for it. And in addition, as the demands for um, internet services, as technologies upgrade, um, that uh, people would be willing to pay more for that. So I think that's the assumption there, and that's based on their experience working in, in other communities. Hey, did you guys look at the amount of bandwidth going out of Goldendale between the different ISPs to ensure that, I mean, I can sell 100 embeds, I can sell 200 embeds, but if my system's bogged down at 6 o'clock and you're only getting 4 out of your 200, too bad. And so did you guys look into that at all? Um, well, I mean, are you, so are you talking about the connections like going down to uh, the Dalles, that connection, or are you talking about... From here to Hood River, from here to Portland, from here to the Pidock, wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. We've heard anecdotally that some of those connections, at least in the past, were not good, but some of them have been fixed. But our study didn't look out that far. Yeah, I think the answer is no. I mean, anecdotally, we did understand some things have been upgraded, including these ISP stakeholder interviews, but no, not that far. Other questions or comments that folks have? Larry, did you have any critiques in there? Or, uh, did, you, did you get a good look at yeah. It hasn't been out that long, so you still got some time to chew on it. I think we've got to get through curve this fall. Okay. Right, and get right. Your, your report out done. Well, I wanted to reiterate uh, something Jake said, and that is, and Kerry pointed out to it too, that, that we need to have a map that shows where our gaps are. And I think we need to, again, talk with the ISPs and indicate to them that we want to come to them with, as a public-private partnership. Not, hopefully they can then understand that what we're trying to do is get to gaps in the system so we can enter into a, as, as Justin's starting to point out, is get those, those gaps identified so that we can identify what needs to go in the grant application so, or the low interest mm -hmm. loan application, so we know that our money is being the best bang for your buck, and where those, where can we find that that bang for the buck? And so uh, I think that a little bit more work needs to be done mm -hmm. to provide a map like that, and hopefully maybe some additional information from the ISPs to help mm -hmm. narrow that down. And to determine if the RFPs, mm -hmm. our RFP proposal is the right way to go, because those, isn't that such that that the ISP would pay the, the city back for the loan that's used to help their system? Is that yeah, this is this is not intended to be the city paying to upgrade right. the system. You might be able to write down the interest rate or whatnot, or revolve some loan funds. You're administering. Right. It's. It's inexpensive money, and so curbs um, for the state's uh, interest rates are like between 1 and 
percent, which is probably, I'm guessing, better than the ISPs have uh, normally have access to if they have to mm -hmm. go to the bank or whatever. But we did hear from some of the ISPs that would be helpful. Yeah, so we're thinking about gaps, and you said we find there's a gap. There's no coverage. There's not enough speed. Maybe there's not enough competition. You know, there's just one provider. Let's say. Um, then I feel like there's a secondary almost analysis that we have to do is, well, what do we want to do to fill the gap, right? Like, there's different ways to do that. Right. Um, and that's still kind of unclear to me, like, what, I feel like it could be different in different parts of town, mm -hmm. you know, what, what we do to fill the gap. Um, yeah. And then also, you know, if we're administering the loan, what's to say the ISPs are going to even want to take us up on, you know, borrow from us to do the work? Right, because they still have it's a liability for them, you know. And just because it's cheaper loan than going to a bank or something, I mean, is there an incentive really? Just just it being a cheaper loan for them to fill the gaps. I think the idea there that we've heard about, and we have ISPs in the room, was that if there's they're they're working in an area that we've identified, and there's an alignment there, uh, one of the one of the line items will be the cost of money. And that's directly re reflected in how fast that project can go and how much it costs to the end user. We wouldn't need to go here alone. We, we would simply get an A location and a Z location and run it through our construction crew and just give you a price, what it would cost mm -hmm. to build. If there's any revenue tied to that, then we can try to absorb that cost as much as possible mm -hmm. to bring it down. Yeah. If there's no revenue tied to it, then we just give you a flat Here's what it's going to cost to, to build it, kind of thing. But we wouldn't need to go get a loan to do it. Right. So, yes. when, uh, I just went to the USA Broadband Conference over in Olympia this last week, and uh, one thing I heard from the ISPs is, is there's a lot of people who put a lot of money, their own money, into building out these networks. And now you want to come in and use federal funds or state funds to overbuild on top of my network, either as a municipal, because there's a lot of municipalities or PUDs that are getting into it, and directly compete with me with cheaper money over something that I'm already serving and providing for. And I think that's something that we have to be aware of, that, you know, when you're proposing to build this line, you, you might be saying, you know, you've got cable, ground, cable on the ground, you've got wireless, you've got DSL, you've got fiber, and if you're going to come in and build, say, cable, well, that directly is giving that direct competition or that, that benefit to one provider and not the others. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're saying, we're going to go and the city or maybe the county is going to get funding from the state to build a line down the industrial avenue where there's currently no fiber involved as an economic development project, and then we're going to open it up to all the ISPs, we're going to tie it into to either their lines or his lines or somebody's line who's going out of here, but it's going to be open competition and any ISP can serve it. That's something, because it's not an area that's already served, that's something that, that more people can get behind. At least the providers who actually have dollars and cents already in the ground. Well said. We are yeah, very aware of the, the issue of competition and particularly of uh, public folks getting into that competition where we've got the free market. So I think you said it perfectly. I mean, our intention here is to provide the study and the study findings that you want to help the community advance broadband and not to eliminate or consolidate competition, but rather have that, that city uh, be a partner to bring those projects uh, for the ISPs to operate. And we, we had a lot of discussion in the first round of meeting about what's the model. Does the city want to be a purveyor? And we didn't. We just really confirmed early on, no. Uh, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen that way. There's some legal issues that way. We're really talking about enabling the ISPs to be the best that they can be. So I think we're, we're picking up some good information, Ethan, on how to address this. I think we talked really, really at length um, about how much more ISP coordination there could be, that the whole study could be about that. I mean, it's a, it's a really long conversation. But we did the best with what we could within the resources provided in the curb grant. And I think we can take this information and, and, and make this a better product. But we certainly 
I appreciate your comments, and I think we want to operate in that same vein as the public um, entity uh, being pretty even-handed and helpful in the ISP's work. Well, so one thing um, uh, I think that you're getting at is kind of a wholesaler versus retailer yeah. um, issue, which is kind of what Scott We're was talking about. We're going retail. Right. City can't go retail because that's prohibited by state law, but you can be a wholesaler to the ISPs of a dark fiber system. Um, and so the city did determine pretty early on that that's not the route that you wanted to go. Um, and so we tried to formulate um, something else that was going to work. And so I think part of the answer to that question and getting over that hurdle can also be overcome by the type of RFP vehicle that's used. And so Scott, I think earlier mentioned um, revolving loan funds. And so potentially if the, the city got a grant package or some low interest loans from the state, they could build up a revolving loan fund that could go and be available to all of the ISPs to say improve service in a certain area and then that ISP would take that, the, the winning ISP would um, take that money, pay it back and then the city could move on to another area. So it doesn't have to be sort of like this all or nothing black or white situation. You could still sort of have a patchwork of ISPs serving Goldendale um, and some of those ISPs may have strategic advantages in certain areas of town over the others, but not in other areas of town. And so you could sort of, um, you could you could run it that way too, and that would help overcome sort of that perception mm -hmm. of just having one ISP sort of, you know, win or take all scenario, which is something we wanted to. Yeah, I think we put that in the findings. It sounds like when we plan our road work, we come up with a five-year plan. We say. Yeah. This road needs work, this one, and then over time, we, we then send it out for bid, and we work on it one by one, basically. Is it kind of the same concept, basically? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that makes sense. That's kind of what we're doing already for our public works. You know. And I think the main message is you're not trying to compete with the ISPs. You're just trying to recognize and, and, and build a system where it needs it. Other thoughts, folks that haven't had a chance to share? Drove far enough that they get to speak more than <laughs> once? <laughs> well, I think that our job is to circle this around one more time, try to button up what we can in terms of unanswered questions, give around the calls to the ISPs. We, um, we put um, a lot of energy into getting here with the draft plan. I appreciate the feedback you've given us. We think it's a positive step forward. And, and I think it's really important that this reflect what the city of Goldendale wants. We don't want a plan that goes for available public money just because it's there. We want this to make sense to you, and we want these, these action items to be directed, even-handed in a way that the ISPs also get behind. So, I mean, I see some things that maybe could be improved, but I haven't heard somebody just stand up and say we're completely missing the mark. I think we can get you there, right? Other comments? Did I miss anything, Ethan, in terms of asking questions? We've got, we've got time here. Um, we're coming up on 8 o'clock. If, uh, if you don't feel like you got your questions answered or you want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, why don't we do that at the official close and we can talk about some of these issues, either the, the action items, recommendations, or the map, and do a little one-on-one. -on -one. Does that make sense? Sure. Good. Thank you. Thanks very much for the opportunity to serve the good city, and we'll hope to get this tuned up and in the shape that you can be proud of and maybe get some things done with near term. Thanks. Thank you.